folks, Joseph A. Sabari here, and I'm doing a new movie review this week. And I finally got a chance to see a sequel to the 1996 summer blockbuster sci-fi action adventure, Independence Day Resurgence. And sad to say, it was a huge letdown. It really was. I was hoping this would definitely be a great sequel for a film that was made 20 years ago. Yeah, and it basically sets 20 years too late, sadly. But I knew that this was going to happen because, of course, Will Smith no longer takes the fall for this movie. And since he wound up doing the new movie Suicide Squad, so now his character dies. You know, Steve Hillard, that is. And now, a few of the cast members from the original film had still remained. Well, it's great to see Jeff Goldblum back on the screen again, because I hardly ever see him in movies these days. I mean, the last movie I saw him in was the Robin Williams film, uh, Man of the Year. So, it's great to see him back as uh, David Leverston. Also, you got to see uh, Judd Hirsch back again, you know, playing the father, you know, Julius. Um, Bill Pullman back as uh, President Whitmore, who's now a former. As well as Brett Spiner playing uh, Dr. Brackish Okun, who's now uh, awakened from his coma. Yeah, and uh, Vivica A. Fox. But this time we got new actors, um, such as Liam Hensworth, you know, who's been in films like uh, The Hunger Games and um, The Expendables 2. I know he was in that terrible film called Paranoia with Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman. Yeah, that was a bad film. They also have um, Jesse T. Usher with... Uh, William Frickner, Sailor Ward, um, as well as Charlotte Gainsbourg, Angela Baby, yes, yeah, a Chinese actress. Uh, also, Joey Keane, best known for her role in the Ramona Beasts, you know, when she played Ramona. And I know she was in the film All is the Great and Powerful. We should play China Girl. And also they even got uh, Robert Loja back, which sadly he passed away you know, after this film was finished. So there you go. Well, there are some interesting moments, I'll give you that. I mean, for starters, even though the CGI wasn't really that spectacular this time around, I mean, definitely doesn't hold a candle to the special effects that they used in the 1996 film. It actually did uh, have the the aliens again. I mean, even though it's all well well done in, in CGI, so it, it looks really cool. So it didn't look that bad. I have to admit, the ships, on the other hand. Not so much, and there are effects in the movie that just seems like they went way overblown, and and some of those destruction scenes almost remind me of the the other film that Roland Emmerich has done called 2012, and maybe all the other films that follow. I mean, because I know we've been getting so many ripoffs, so, you know, like Skyline and. Battle of Los Angeles, <laughs> but yeah, I mean it, it had its moments for some of the destruction they used, but then it's just well, it isn't really as memorable as it could be. Yeah, a new score that's done by Harold Kostler and Thomas Wanker. Yeah, that's his name, Wanker, and even the score wasn't even that memorable either. I mean, luckily they still had the theme from. 
the original film that's only in the end credits uh, done by David Arnold. And David Arnold definitely knows how to create a very good score. And, and it shows because this movie really didn't have the energy. It's really missing something too. It, it misses the, the heart and energy that went into the original Independence Day. Despite of the film being corny and preachy, I mean, it, it was still fun. I mean, you, you never forget the, the destruction they use in the film. All done with uh, practical effects. You know, they use miniatures for, for those shots. And they actually use little CGI in the, between those shots alone. Like, mostly the, the, the lightning beam from the ships and even the, the movements of of the jets uh, from the squadrons and all of that so it's perfect so anyway but let's get to the film it stars Liam Hansworth, Jeff Goldblum, Jesse T. Usher, Bill Pullman, Maka Moreau who was in the film uh, It Follows as well as um, most recently, which is a terrible film called The Fifth Wave. Celia Ward, who has been known for that TV series Sisters. Um, yeah, it was a TV show that came out in the late 80s um, that aired on NBC. William Frickner, who's been in several films. Judd Hirsch, Brett Spiner, Vivica A. Fox. Angela Baby, Charlotte Gainsbourg, Depierre Aubrey, with Nicholas Wright, Nang Chin Han, Robert Loja, John Story, Joey Keane. It's written by Roland Emmerich with Dean Devlin, along with Nicholas Wright, James A. Woods, and James Vanderbilt and it's directed by Roland Emmerich. The movie begins set 20 years ago after a devastating alien invasion that they had and they actually won during the war of 1996. The United Nations has set up the Earth Space Defense which is a research program to reverse engineered alien technology which uh, prepares for for all the military bases that are in Moon, Mars, and Rhea. So, Area 51's base in Nevada has become their headquarters. So, on July 2nd, 2016, the world's being prepared to celebrate the 20th anniversary of their survival after their evasion. That's when we meet African State Republic Nation Now, Tiamtu, where ESD director David Levinson, who's played by Jeff Goldblum, had met with Kathleen Massu, played by Charlotte Gainsbourg, and a warlord, the Kimbi Umbutu, you know, who's the guy who has the machete on the back and he has a lot of tattoos. Yeah. But they led him into an intact alien destroyer, and on board the ship, they discovered that the alien accompanies had to send a distress call to call their home planet that's already been defeated. So then, on to and the former U.S. President Thomas Whitmore, who was played by Bill Pullman, are among those who have uh, te telepathy uh, links for the aliens, since so they have personal encounters with them. But when they're at Area 51, Dr. Brackish Onkon, played by Brett Spiner, has been awakened from his coma. And, and they're ready to uh, set up something by the time June 3rd arrives. And that's when the spherical ship with technology difference from the aliens emerged from a wormhole that's near the SSD's moon defense headquarters. So Levinston believes that it belongs to another extraterrestrial race. So they urge um, the World Security Council not to attack, 
but they both just shoot it down regardless. But on July 4th, against their orders, they hired the, the squadron, which includes pilots Jake Morrison and Charlie Miller, yeah, both played by Liam Hensworth and Travis Tope, decided to pick up Levinson, Marceau, and Umtu, with Levinson's accountant Floyd Rosenberg, who's played by Nicholas Wright, on a space tug as they head for Reckless. Yeah, which they actually recovered in the container. Yeah, this is the scene where, sort of similar to the scene in the movie, in the 1996 film, you know, where Levinson was riding onto that ship, um, the alien ship, with Stephen Hiller, you know, played by Will Smith. Well, they did a similar scene right here, and this time it's with him and Jake Morrison. And boy, they were going for for urine jokes too in this movie. Like they said, "Did you pee your pants?" Yeah, me too. Yeah, because they had to go all the way straight to um, the city that's already in destruction. So the alien mothership is 3,000 miles uh, in diameter, which suddenly emerges and destroys Earth's planetary defense before approaching the planet. So space tug is being caught uh, the mothership's gravitation pull, which lifts objects from across Asia. So that's where the destruction lies ahead, where everything just goes into breeze with other countries like Europe, the Atlantic or Ocean, Eastern Seaboard, you name it. Just like the destruction they had, even Washington DC. So they, there were a lot of destructions that was happening. Just like it was in the 1996 film. You know, where Los Angeles, New York, Washington DC were all destroyed. Yeah, those major cities. So they learned that one of the um, the aliens uh, that exists is the queens, so they're they're there to actually command the evasion that's about to happen. So then, in Area 51, Okun opens the container to release a giant white spear of virtual intelligence. Yeah, because we really need one, which reveals that the mission to evacuate the survivors from the worlds being targeted by the aliens, which they call the Harvesters. To, to get around a viral resistance force. So already in the mothership, Dale and Jake and other survivors managed to escape the hijack enemy attack crafts and pursue the Queen's personal ship. So knowing the Queen of the where of the spills perseverance, the SCDs force Hyde to isolation the chamber and use a decoy to lure the Queen's ship to trap filled with fusion weapons. Anyway, so Whitmore against his daughter's his daughter Patricia who's played by Malka Moreau's wishes was a volunteer to pilot the space tug on the suicide mission. Yeah, which apparently plays out like the like what happened to um, Randy Craig's character in the nineteen ninety six film. Yeah, I know I'm doing the comparison because frankly, this is what this film was really trying to be. Yeah. You know, where they had to put in the nuke inside the mothership and then suddenly explodes. Well, he's doing exactly the same thing, only different. And there you go. It, it destroys. He dies. And then the rest of the squadron continues to shoot against the, the alien. And it also leads into a beef hive in that sort of way. Yeah, it, yeah, like a beehive. It creates a hive uh, with all the ships uh, moving around and around and around through the alien in order to protect them. And, of course, they destroyed it. While, while Julius, who's played by uh, Judd Hirsch, is just, um, who just got picked up after riding on the boat, and trying to escape from that destruction. You know, he was awakened and 
was already been taken by a bunch of kids who are just about to visit their grandparents. Yeah, one of them is played by Joey Keane as Samantha Blackwell. He's one of the yeah one of the siblings to actually find a place to um, to escape. So they wind up riding on along a a school bus, <laughs> which yeah basically it's a school bus going to camp. So they had to drive around into the desert, you know, before the attack arrives. That's when they, when Julius finally met uh, David Leverston, you know, who's already working on a plan to actually kill the the aliens and the motherships. So while the squadron continues to to attack, and there you go. Even with um, Patricia joining in. And, yep, that's exactly how the film went, and, <laughs> yeah, this is a huge letdown to the original Independence Day, and that's the film I would rather watch many times than having to sit through this again. I mean, it, and it sucks, too, because even I couldn't connect with the young characters in this movie this time around, and... Even though, you know, there are some good, talented actors right there, but it's just sad that they just couldn't handle it. I mean, it was great to see um, a few of the original cast members back again, like Jeff Goldblum, Bill Pullman, uh, along with Judd Hirsch, Brett Spiner, Vivica A. Fox. So they're the only, yeah, they're the only survivors in, in the film, but sadly... <laughs> You know, they, they just couldn't save it. On the other hand, though, I thought Jeff Goldblum did a great job. It was great to see him back again as Levison. He definitely is the only one that's alive in this movie. But Liam Hensworth, I swear to God, he is no Stephen Hiller. I swear to God, he is no Will Smith. He He's basically just playing a hotshot pilot who's who's now uh, Patricia Whitmore's fiance, and he's also best friends with Charlie Miller who was really really annoying yeah, played by Travis Tope. I mean he's basically Jar Jar Binks in that sort of way. Wow like we really need another Jar Jar Binks kind of character. But this one is just really really annoying. Uh, I just wanted to punch him in the face. I mean, he started coming out with stupid lines like, let's get real real, and and then he keeps, um, he keeps screaming like a girl, and all of that. You know, he's also falling in love with um, a Chinese girl named Rain Leo, played by Angela Baby. Um, she was... I mean, she didn't do much for me either. I mean, but she was there. And also, Bill Pullman, uh, back as Thomas J. Whitmore. I mean, he just feels so weak, tired, goofy. And it's just really sad to see him like this. Because, you know... You know, he still remember having all the nightmares he's been having uh, after the the evasion attack that happened in 1996. I mean, they even show clips of his important speech uh, during Independence Day. And that was a very powerful speech that he gave uh, in the 1996 film. I really loved that speech. And it's like, great. And the sad part is he dies in the movie in a suicide mission, which is just ridiculous. <sighs> but there you go. Jesse T. Usher is is even worse. I mean, he's just... I'm sorry, but I just didn't buy him as the son of, um, of Stephen Hiller. And I know he was played by Ross Bagley in the original film, and Boy, I wish they had cast him instead of just T. Usher because he's just, he's just, um, 
He just, I mean, he's just boring. He doesn't do it for me. I mean, his character is, is just nothing. So, there you go. Sailor Ward, um, who's playing a female president in the in the film. Well, of course, once again, she's, well, she was alright, though. I'll give you that. She was actually very tough. Tough as nails, and she definitely really shows exactly what she's doing, even though she did die off screen. Yeah. William Fickner, playing the general in this movie. Um, he's no Robert Loja, but he did okay. Yeah, Brett Spiner, who was in the first film. It's great to see him back after awakening from a 20 year coma. I mean, from. You know, his character, that is, uh, as the, the scientist. Which, yeah, that's the, which I know it, which did bother me too, because even though he is awakened, he's basically, he basically works with, um, with Dr. Milton Isaacs, which apparently, you know, they are, you know, they are partners now. And I know that's what they're going to go for, and I know I don't want to, explain more about that but at least he came back you know trying to figure out what the aliens are doing Vivica A. Fox uh, who played Stephen Hillers his widower I came back now but not for long of course because you know she gets killed you know during that rescue mission just after all the buildings were collapsed so that sucks Charlotte Gainsbourg, uh, also very good in, in the film as a French psychiatrist, I'll give you that. Definitely perfect uh, associated for David Leviston, even though we already learned about uh, his wife, uh, Constance Spano, died in a car accident in the film, so I know that sucks. Yeah, they've been killing off um, some of the survivors in, in the movies. There are other cast members in the movie too, but I don't want to explain too much. The CGI effects in the movie is not that spectacular. I mean, basically you get all the destruction, all the lasers that the aliens are shooting. Yeah, their mother ships are are basically quite different now and and quite huge than than the other ships that they use in the 1996 movie. Um, we do get to see some of the aliens in the movie, and that they do look almost the same as the the aliens you saw in the 1996 movie, but they're all also different ones. And of course, they even throw in a white spear. Seems seems like you know they were going to go for another character to actually help them fight against the aliens. But hey, they they now have all the alien technology, so they can actually use them. So there you go. And of course they now have small ships too to fight. So it just didn't do it for me. And on top of that, this movie really did have some bad scenes too. In fact, even the scenes in the film are very similar to the 1996 movie. Like, they even tried to do that one moment in the film where, where, um, Dr. Alcoon actually was in the lab doing surgery on, on the alien that Stephen Hiller had found. And that's where they started the attack, and that's when they, they created the Tiff Paffrey. You know, because remember that, that, yeah, remember that scene where the alien had, um, had squeezed um, the scientist's, Alcoon's neck, the telepathy? That, that was explaining to uh, Whitmore, and I know he gets it too. And now Thomas J. Whitmore is inside the protected shield, and suddenly the alien appeared and grabbed Whitmore's neck and using the telepathy. And I also noticed that they even started using the telepathy not only on a coon, but they also use it on the, uh, the machete man himself. 
Yeah, because he fought all the aliens. And Whitmore had did that in front of her daughter, along with the rest. So they're doing exactly the same thing. I couldn't believe it. And of course, they even killed the alien, just like that. Of course, you know he want to fight. He want to go against him because, after all, he did do this before. So he wants to do it again. But his daughter could have let him. So there you go. Oh boy. There are other things that happened in the movie, such as uh, the scene where um, there was even another stupid moment when Jake Morrison was already on top of all the ships and where the aliens are, and they actually he climbed up aboard, he meet all the aliens, and and he was actually explaining about what they did to his parents by actually giving a middle finger and start peeing around the ship. Yeah, I couldn't believe that myself. This was in the movie. <sighs> wow. <sighs> and the movie's only two hours. It's not even um, over two hours long like I expected it to be. It just felt like it was very short. Yeah. And this movie only made three hundred and seventy two million dollars worldwide out of its hundred and sixty five million budget where did the money go exactly where did the money go because it just didn't look this good it's and it's such a shame that this movie really has bad writing in it and it has five writers yeah five writers I mean surely enough you got Roland Emmerich and Dee Devlin back to write the screenplay they're also the producers too and of course Amber is the director. But you got Nicholas Wright, James A. Woods, and James Vanderbilt. They can't write for shit. And that's the problem. And speaking of Nicholas Wright, yeah, he plays Floyd Rosenberg, who's an accountant. And he's just basically an expert to, to learn how to fight the aliens after meeting Demaku Amatu. He's just there, just, you know. Was, you know, he's nervous at first, but he just learns how to use the alien gun and all that. Uh, it's nothing special, but hard to believe because he wrote the screenplay. There you go. <sighs> I'm sorry. I mean, I'd rather watch the original film 500 times than having to sit for this mess again. Because this movie will be long forgotten in the next 20 years. Yes, because even at the end, they almost act like they were going to set up for another sequel. Well, I don't know if that's ever going to happen because this movie really stinks. And it's sad because I really wanted to like this movie. I really did. So, that's Independence Day Resurgence and I give that film one and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora and I'll see you later. Bye.